Please pronounce your name correctly for me. Sigga Björg Sigurðardóttir. Could you do that again a little slower for me? Okay. Sigga Björg Sigurðardóttir. I'm horrible with languages, so Sigga, Sigga will be okay? Yeah, Sigga. It's great. Okay, great. What do you go by professionally? Do you use all three names? I do professionally, yeah. It's actually a shortening, you know, because my f- <laughs> my first name is Sigríður. But uh, Sika has been my nickname my whole life. So when I lived in Scotland for many years, then I just got rid of the old, you know, Sigrid name. It was too much for anyone. Totally understandable. Okay. Yeah. All right. My, one of the first things I always love to know about people is basically how did you become creative? So parents, schooling, like what, what got you into even being creative in the first place? Well, it's quite simple. In my case, I was drawing since, you know, my parents put me in art school when I was five years old. I was just drawing the whole time. So I, I kind of grew up with an artist mom and my parents very understanding and interested in the arts so and my mother being a textile artist and so they put me in art school and ever since I remember myself I was good at drawing (laughs) so I just continued to do that and then after I graduated from gymnasium I went straight to art school and not because I loved art well I did but it was because I was good at drawing (laughs) But then I learned about contemporary art and everything once I was in art school. But it was all about because of drawing, basically. Okay, wait one second. Let's go back a second. You have in Iceland, by the way, you were my first Icelandic guest. I want to throw that out there. Very excited. <laughs> you have art schools in Iceland for five-year-olds. Yeah, classes, art classes. And <laughs> my mother was at the uh, the art school. The you know she was doing her degree in art when I was five years old. So they had classes for kids in the basement. And I remember being put in one of these classes, but I was like by far the youngest because the other kids were like nine year olds. And at the time, everybody was wearing like mohawks in the art school. Like the grown ups were like punk rock. I thought it was really exciting, and I think I just all these crazy looking artist people that were so sweet and friendly to the kids. So yeah, we got to be in the basement with some professional artists teaching us how to draw and stuff. (laughs) It's marvelous. I was thinking like there was like in the way like you go into a gymnasium and it's like technical or mathematical or science or arts that that started at five years old, but it's not that. This was sort of a outside of core curriculum thing. (laughs) yeah (laughs) okay good yeah yeah it was definitely yeah and then you went on to go to school and and get your master's in scotland correct yes correct what drove that interest i think it was just a stomach feeling you know i wanted to go to the uk i was looking at london but then i don't know i found a scotland i at the time i'd never been to scotland And somebody told me about the Glasgow School of Art being one of the top schools in the whole of UK. So I applied and I got in and then I moved there. It was like that. I I had no idea about, yeah, I think I was just following a feeling of wanting to be there, like wanting to live in that country. Well, did you have an intention of being like a professor or a teacher or anything like this? Because oftentimes people who go for MFAs would do that for the sole purpose of that. No, I only wanted to get, you know, change my environment because when I was studying, <laughs> I mean, I live in Iceland. It makes sense to move somewhere. And <laughs> so I, I basically went to, I wanted, first I thought I wanted to, learn animation or something like that and then thankfully some professor at the art school in Iceland told me that was I should go for fine art so I did that and but uh, but I really had the strong feeling that at the time when I was studying in Reykjavik when I was doing my BA 
it was the school was like super conceptual and being like more of a drawing painting person I wanted to go somewhere and find out different art scenes and I didn't feel like I belonged in the art scene in Iceland until later. <laughs> so that's interesting. So, so you think that the, or at least that school, the Reykjavik in Reykjavik was very conceptual. Like if I were to sit back and think Icelandic art, I would probably say indigenous kind of like sort of tribal kind of things or very conceptual. Like those would be the two ends of the spectrum. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, that that's pretty. Okay. Yeah. I think of myself as reasonably worldly, so I hope to know this. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite an amazing art scene, actually, because there are so many artists living here. I think that's what makes it so fun to live here, you know, to be an artist, because there's like a lot of, and it, it's it's not super commercial. It's quite, you know, a lot of artist run spaces. And so, mm hmm one thing that I'm fascinated about Iceland is sort of based on what you're talking about, which is that there are tons of artists there, lots of creative people, Icelandic music, like there's tons of different versions of creativity that comes out of Iceland. Mm -hmm. Part of that, I believe, is because of the amazing, I don't know, I don't even know what it is, so help me out, but like there seems to be some governmental support kind of like things that sort of... There is some <laughs> governmental support you can apply for it's not quite as grand as in you know like sweden or or norway surrounding countries but i wouldn't complain we can apply for all the you know different kinds of grants so there is governmental help okay but what kind of governmental help? the reason why i'm asking is because on your cv i was noticing things like professional artist salary that's <laughs> given by the ministry of culture yeah. okay I've never even heard of something like that before. They pay your salary. Mm -hmm. That's insane. Well, you apply and it's like super competitive. And every year you have to apply in October for the, the coming year. So you have to list what you, what you have coming up. And, and you can get everything from three months up to two years of being paid monthly minimum wage but still for an artist that's grand you know i will take minimum wage yeah so every year we apply for this and you know and and it's always like this moment in january when it's like you know people go crazy somebody you know who gets it and who not and but at least it's there and okay wait a minute though what is icelandic minimum wage I'm I'm not so good with these kind of numbers. <laughs> well, because I would imagine your minimum wage is very different than American minimum wage or Czech minimum wage. Well, it's very expensive to live in Iceland. So Correct. That's why I'm saying it. <laughs> this grant we apply for, it's compared to people with normal jobs. They wouldn't find they would not find this good wage, you know. But for us, this is like fantastic because it's the monthly this monthly payment like right now i have 6 months and that's totally like amazing <laughs> it's yes. just creates this kind of security that it's really hard to get come by as an artist so within that we can you know be creative without having to think about paying bills you know <laughs> at least that will be covered that sounds magical, but okay. Is that only available for Icelandic citizens or like, let's say I'm an artist from another country and I want to come to Iceland and mm. do some work. Can I apply for those kinds of grants? Yeah. Yes, you can. <gasps> Score. I'm all yeah. for it. Let's do it. Yeah. You don't need the citizenship. You just need to be a part of the art scene and you have to have like a legal home in Iceland or something like this. Okay. That's a little bit of a barrier. <laughs> but yeah, well... You need to be working within the art scene, basically. I, but I'm not sure what the rules are, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you don't need the citizenship. That's No, you don't. Since you're my first Icelandic guest, tell me a little bit about like what constitutes the art scene there. Now, where are you in Reykjavik or are you outside, like in some not city-oriented place? Like, so like, give me some background on where you are. Yeah, well, I'm in the city center of Reykjavik. 
and I have my studio here as well, by like 10 minutes away from my home. So yeah, I, I live and work very local, you know, in, in the, in the Reykjavik center. And is it like a nice tight knit community? Like, do you all know each other and share things or is it very like competitive? Like, give me some sort of like mm -hmm. gossip on the, on the art okay. scene. <laughs> okay. I would say it was like super, we all know each other, basically. Visual artists, musicians, you know, it's a very tight knit community of artists and we've some people have even you know known each other since childhood this is such a small population in this country and the art scene i have experienced it mostly you know like quite friendly i mean of course it is competitive because we don't have so many opportunities and we all have to apply for the same grants and apply for the same exhibitions and stuff but i think all in all it's like pretty much like a big family like a large family of when people are supportive and help out each other my studio is in a building with lots of other artists it's in the Reykjavik Association of S Sculptors <laughs> so it's really nice institution thing yeah I miss that from grad school like having that communal studio space yeah, I mean, I have my own private studio, but at least, you know, there is communal space where you can go downstairs and meet people. And, you know, there's workshops where you can build things and make things communally. But yeah, so I think that's really nice because otherwise we'd be, I'd be super isolated. <laughs> it's isolating enough to live here. <laughs> You're sounding a little down on Iceland. Uh, really? Is it just the end of winter? You're just a little like, okay, I want some time away. Well, it's, there's been like this <laughs> pandemic. So nobody has left the island for like a year and a half. No, like it's, no, I, I really didn't mean to sound down on Iceland. <laughs> You're like, but you know, I live in Iceland. <laughs> like, so yeah, no, I meant there is limited opportunities, which, which is what I meant. Living here is great, but. It's a great community of artists, but also most people have part of their careers going on elsewhere. Which was going to be my next question, which was sort of, is there a need to be involved in the outside world, you know, sort of off island? I, I, what, how do you all refer to that? Like off island? Is that what you say? I've never, I've never used that word, but it sounds good. <laughs> when we'll I'm off island. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think there's some artists who are pretty much very you know they're very local and then all the other artists that are more international uh, i think like in every art scene there's like some local artists that you know don't have an international career and then there's artists that work more internationally and don't do so much here and you know i think it's it's all different but i think it is if you're going to try and live from this i think it's very important to have an international career as well because it really yeah again it's an island <laughs> well i mean that that's the thing is like everybody talks about like you build your community you know your your people in your sort of tribe in your neighborhood whatever but mm -hmm. at a certain point you're going to run out of opportunities to exhibit or you're going to run out of collectors to buy more of your work because they only their homes are only so large or their own collections are only yeah. so big and you're going to have to branch out. So that's why I sort of wonder, like, Iceland is, I mean, I, I don't take any of this offensively, but like, it's kind of isolated uh, in, f geographically. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine it's a little difficult uh, for you, or maybe it was difficult and is it getting easier? So like websites, social media, like, has it gotten easier in the past, you know, 10 years? A little bit. I think maybe it has to do with the internet. Or maybe it has to do with there seems to be more interest in Icelandic art from abroad than there used to be back when I was. It, it just feels like, yeah, I feel like there are more opportunities going on that possibly are linked to off-island places. <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> I've, I've coined a phrase. It's excellent. <laughs> Well, because like looking through your CV, like you've been doing exhibitions in Sweden and in, 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 I even saw in New York City and in Germany and Belgium and all kinds of different places. So like, mm -hmm. 
I feel like it, to a certain extent, it's it's a necessary element of the growth of somebody's career that like they start sort of locally and then they they expand. So my question then, it really is for you. How did you pull that off? Because ah. <laughs> you're kind of, you know, you're you're not going to the art openings in New York City and meeting people. So like, how did you make these connections and get these opportunities? One, you know, I think Glasgow has a lot to do with it. You know, being having been based, I was based in Glasgow for a long, long time, long, you know, a long time after I graduated. I think that really helped me get some more opportunities. And the Glasgow MFA also, you know, there was a lot of people coming in, like curators and art people that would invite us to do shows in different places. And the MFA group was very international also. So I think that's one of the reasons. Another reason is that not so long after I graduated, I started working with a gallery in Frankfurt. So there was a lot of opportunities coming in Germany and Switzerland, that area. Um, I actually, I've often thought about this, but I, I never really know how <laughs> it was like, you know, if it was chance or, you know, because at the time the work wasn't traveling so much on the internet, you know, it was more like somebody saw a show and, and maybe when I graduated from Glasgow, maybe that was a fortunate time for drawing <laughs> perhaps, or I think it was a different Lots of different things, but I think some of it luck and some of it, I think being, yeah, I think Glasgow seemed to be, a, I seemed to have picked a good place to be based. All right. So did you, how did you get that first gallery? Because like, that, I mean, that's the big thing. A lot of artists are sitting around in their studios and they're making and making and making. And if we have time, we will put more time into producing more artwork before we will go out and socialize or put together a portfolio and submit it to a gallery or whatever. So it's like, mm -hmm. how do you even get that like first gallery? I don't know. In, <laughs> in my case, the gallerist saw my work in an art fair in London. I think it was the Sioux Art Fair. This is years and years ago when I was working with some curators from London that saw my work in my MFA show. And then this particular gallerist from Germany happened to come have an interest for Icelandic artists. And I met her in Iceland. Um, she did a, this kind of studio visit. And, and then we were working together for, I think, seven or eight years. But that gallery had has closed down now. But it was a nice first experience of working with a gallery. So I actually have never known how that happens. If that's a chance or, you know. <laughs> oh, no, you know exactly. How it, no, I don't have any wise strategies or. Why well, I'm trying to figure out the wise strategies. Well, uh, they say the you know, not that I know, but, you know, I'm just an artist. But they say that you should never contact a gallery, you know. I don't know if that's true that, you know, if you send, send your portfolio places and, you know, nobody looks at them. So I used to work in a gallery and I don't remember ever picking up or starting to represent anybody who submitted directly to us. Right. That's my point. So I guess it's best not never to do that. And then I figured it's best to just keep working. Well, but you can't keep working like in private, like you still have to be a part of the community. So like you still have to have curators do those studio visits and do other things like, so you still have to be engaged. You can't just be a hermit and making your stuff in, in a, in a cave or anything. Like you actually still have to talk with people and meet with people. True. Yeah, I guess. But I think when you live in an art scene, you go to the openings, you get to know people things happen that way you take part in an art scene wherever you are even if you're in Iceland it's really important to be a part of the scene just like it was important uh, important to be a part of the Glasgow scene when I lived there okay so let's go down to sort of the nuts and bolts of it so like do you are you a hundred percent artist that's the only job you have or do you have other jobs to help out yeah I am a hundred percent artist even though I teach two evening classes 
Okay, that's a little side job. So like we'll call you 90% artist, 10% yeah. <laughs> teacher. Well, I teach drawing, so yeah. It... I love it. I teach and I it, it I feel like it helps sort of keep me sharp because it keeps me questioning why I do things when I have to explain it to somebody else. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, teaching's great. It is great. How do you make that living? So you're selling, are you are you supported by the government? Like what's the how do you make your living? Cuz like I don't yeah. make a living from my art. So I'm coming to you as a as an idiot who's not being successful, asking somebody who, well, by your own mission is being somewhat successful. Some years are good and some are bad. You know, I right now I got this grant from the government for six months and then I do some teaching in between. And sometimes I don't get any grants, but I think I made a decision to never have a really good job I think that's where the danger lies when people get like really nice jobs with good salaries that then they just never go back to the studios because if you work in you know advertising or do something kind of creative and and well paid that's dangerous so I think you just get used to this anxiety of not knowing what next month will bring <laughs> Yeah, but of course I sell my work as well. And sometimes I sell, especially around exhibitions, but sometimes there's no sale. So it's really just not to need too much, you know, to keep the life standards pretty low. And then, you know, as long as you can pay the studio rent and, and your art supplies, art supplies, and, you know, you need a home and, you know, I do. Yeah. We all have the same issues. Do you use like your website or social medias or any other sort of internet things on your own or do your galleries do all of that sort of stuff for you? Ah, well, right now I don't work with a gallery. So okay. I have... So that answers that question. <laughs> so I'm basically doing all the... <laughs> everything, you know, myself. I have a website and Instagram, but I don't have any, you know, like sales you know i don't sell my work that way well i saw some of your works some of your work okay so some is works on paper and some of it is sort of either painted on the walls of an exhibition space or on a public space or something like this so they're sort of permanent and or painted over or washed away or whatever mm -hmm. so it seems like so you've chosen to almost like make like two sets of works. Like you have like site specific installation or performative works. And then you sort of have the works on paper, kind of like Christo. So like he makes his work on paper, sells those to be able to fund the other bigger projects. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not that calculated that the works on paper are just, you know, I don't always have an exhibition space to work in. So I work on paper every day. Just something about working always on paper it's really it's a lot of freedom to not have that scary big canvas of course i sell my drawings that are on paper i have sold wall drawings as well both as being commissioned and uh, <laughs> there was this one museum in sweden that managed to get the wall drawing off as this floppy thing paint of paint. I'm not joking. So I don't know how they did that, but I think it was the watercolor museum in Sweden. Yeah, that, that was interesting. I try not to think of anything made for selling. Okay. And I, I will fully admit that is totally my US perspective of like make a piece of art, put it up, sell it take that money, reinvest it, make more artwork. And that is a completely wrong model as far as Europe is concerned, as far as I can tell. Like you all are very much more about produce something that is meaningful and expressive of your idea and you're funded somehow to do, to, to do the creation of it. So the sales are kind of irrelevant. Well, of course, they're never irrelevant because... <laughs> You know, but yeah, we try to think of it as irrelevant, of course. But having said that, it's it's really important that to be able to sell something. But of course, if you are a video installation artist or something, it's difficult. So it's easier when you have drawing or painting or sculpture or some object to sell. 
What and it, do you only sell original drawings or do you do prints or anything like this? Only originals. I come from a photography background, so we're all about prints. So I'm always yeah. fascinated. I think it's due to a part of it is technical laziness. It's or practical. I just want the freedom of drawing because I produce a lot of work. You know, I, I draw really, I, I work really fast. So I, and I like the fact that there's many of them and they're all different. And to select which one I'm going to print and make into an object for sales is, is difficult for me. I'm not good at editing. It will stop the process of making it. That fascinates me. So are you, when you're, let's say you have an exhibition all lined up, mm -hmm. you say you make lots of work. So you have a large quantity of things, let's say in your studio that you could potentially exhibit. Mm -hmm. Who makes those decisions? You, curator, gallerist, museum person? Yeah, it depends. Sometimes I, most of the times, you know, I do it. It depends on who I'm working with. If I'm working with a curator that I maybe know or trust, you know, I think it's really helpful to have a, you know, I, I I try to use curators and and museum people to do this with me. You know, like bounce back and forth ideas because I think I'm not possibly not my best editor, and I'm not afraid to admit that <laughs> because there's a lot of drawings and and it's always surprising, especially when people are selecting work. I'm I'm like this one. Are you sure? And then I'm like, oh, I really like that one. And but I think. When I was younger, I wanted to be in control of all this, but now I find it fascinating. You know, they're all different. And yeah, I have opened up this possibility that I might not be the best to select, but sometimes I am and I want to control everything. I guess it depends who I'm working with. <laughs> I have the exact same experience, which is that basically like anytime I have a, a, ga a studio visit or a curator look at my works, Almost every time I have some like crap stuff on the, on the walls that I'm just like, ah, those are just sketches. And they're like, those are magnificent. And then I show them the real stuff that I think are like done and finished and beautiful. And they're like, I like the stuff on the wall better. I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck? And, but, but then it gets even worse because I'll do an exhibition and I'll put up, you know, 15 pieces. And then suddenly the, I notice there's like an empty wall and I'll just throw an extra piece up there. Just like, it's just a, a piece that didn't quite fit perfectly, whatever. Everybody loves that random little thing that I threw up at the end and don't care as much about the things that I put a huge amount of work and effort into. What is that? <laughs> Why? I don't know. I'm not sure. It's, I don't know. It's like art work is this independent thing. And, and I feel like we as artists are maybe not always allowed to have this kind of final opinion because they have their own life and energy and it's hard to tell what people will relate to you know it's impossible and also i think it's really can be dangerous to control too much you know you have to like you don't want to control the process too much i don't you know of making the work it needs to be a certain amount of freedom so when you get into an exhibition space that freedom, I feel like this creative process needs to still be going on until the exhibition is finished. And if that involves other people coming in and having opinion, at the same time, if I do not agree, then, you know, I think it's important to <laughs> say, no, I'm not going to show that half finished drawing. <laughs> yeah. There's a certain amount of sort of confidence you have to have, but it, it's a difficult balance because like on the one hand, you, you want to create works that connect with people and or theoretically in the end sell. Mm. But on the other hand, you sort of want to keep true to your vision, your style, whatever kind of thing you want to put to it. So it's, it's a very difficult balance to ride. Period. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. All right. I, uh, there's a thing I've got at this ongoing thing for years. I've had this problem and I wonder what your perspective on this is because you're from a different region. So I'm sort of interested in how this is done sort of in your region, uh, artist statements. Mm. 
Do you do them? Do you write them yourself? Do you have other people or curators write them? Do you enjoy writing them? Well, let's start there. I don't enjoy writing them. <laughs> I think they are a learned thing that we are taught that we have to do. I think sometimes it comes naturally. In my case, I often write texts that are maybe more abstract. They're not a, not really a statement. They're more like a, a text that maybe works with the visual part of the work, like more as to open up ways to read the drawings, more than it's a closure of like explaining what's actually happening there. That's the kind of text that I enjoy writing. But artist statements, oof, I mean, it's great if somebody else writes the text. <laughs> I guess it's important when you are looking at an exhibition to have a text, you know, and it has to be the right text. I feel like I constantly write the wrong text. Like, it, it, I don't know why. I don't know how. I'm very bad with it. Oh, no. I, I like... I love it when curators come in and write text for my work because I feel like they see things and express things that mm. maybe I, I didn't even know I was doing or they find connections to other artists or art history yeah. that, that I didn't even, wasn't even aware of. No, yeah. Uh, I think it's amazing. I think so. It's really cool because that's their job. You know, it's like that we're, we're not supposed to be the analytics of our own work, you know. That's a misunderstanding. It's a big misunderstanding. Agreed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it, but the problem is, is that it's kind of a mandatory thing because like you write grants and requests. Have, have you done any like residencies and things like this also? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they all mandate artist statements in mm -hmm. there and it drives me fucking nuts because they're, they're just ridiculous. Like... I, it, it's hard enough to just be able to make a, an interesting or or beautiful, I use the word beautiful, art piece of art or something that is expressive or whatever. That's hard in and of itself. And generally, we as visual artists have chosen to do, use the visual arts to express ourselves because we're probably not good writers. <laughs> like, that's why we, if I was a good writer, I would have been a writer. <laughs> True. Yeah, and I, I mean, it is basically like, you know, a writer needs to make their own book cover. No, I totally agree. I think it, it, I find it ridiculous because like, I mean, if you hold on to the text too much, then, I mean, it's visual art. Then aren't you missing the, <laughs> I think the work doesn't need words. Or, I mean, it, you should be able to experience a piece of visual art without the text. The text is, can be interesting if it's creative, like an interesting text. But if it's just like information, information, then, you know, are, aren't we just missing the fact that we're supposed to be like experiencing the piece of art, you know, like we're, that's how I feel about this. But I'm sure a lot of people would disagree. <laughs> I'm sure there are. But I mean, but there's also even not, not even like text. There's also just titling the work like i hate the pressure of titling a work because i one time i actually titled a work i, I, I titled it like i don't know some woman's name like elizabeth or no i don't remember what it was it was beatrice i titled a piece beatrice and i had a friend who, who was like oh my gosh i love this piece i want to buy it and, and then she went she leaned over and she looked at the title and she it said beatrice and she goes oh no, I don't want it anymore because she had some bad experience with somebody named Beatrice and I lost the sale Wow! because I titled it poorly. Wow. That's a sad story. My connection, like relationship with titles, I, I never used to title my work, but now I quite enjoy it. I feel like it's a part of, part of the drawing to give it a title and it's become like an extra part of the draw you know it's not to explain the drawing it's to open up like i was talking about before like to more to open up gateways to you know you're looking and you get just one word beatrice or whatever it is then you know it, it kind of it, it possibly can ruin the drawing i'm aware of that it like in your story it's obviously <laughs> danger zone 
I told her I was willing to retitle it for her if she'll buy it, but you know, she wouldn't oh, go no. for it. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's a pretty bad Beatrice experience there. I apologize to anybody named Beatrice listening, but that did not go well for me, no. Well, it's a nice name. <laughs> I thought so. All right. Works on paper. I'm fascinated with it. So how, okay, did you, how did you come to choosing to do works on paper? Did you say... I don't want to deal with canvases and lugging canvases around and shipping canvases or like, so was there some sort of intentional purpose of state of choosing it in that way? Or was it that you uh, pure like love of paper? When I was doing my BA in Iceland, I was in a painting department. So I did a lot of painting during my BA paintings, you know, oil on canvas and acrylics on canvas, all of this. And it always felt like the drawings were sketches. That's how they taught you, you know, you should do a sketch and then you do a drawing, like a painting. So it wasn't like, I think I didn't realize until I started my MFA in Glasgow that somebody just said to me, hang on, like, isn't this just the work? And basically, and I was like, yeah, maybe it is. And it's, I, that's what I actually enjoy doing. I, you know, just did the sketches all the time, but I hated doing the paintings. And I had this difficult relationship with painting, drawing also because the material was cheap, it, you know, at least in Glasgow, you know, I got this big massive roll of free paper and, you know, it was just easy to get by, you know, like newsprint paper and paper that wasn't so good, you know, but, but still it was all of a sudden all this material to work on that I didn't have to pay so much for <laughs> and using, you know, cheaper materials. I think that was a big part of this, you know, new, newly discovered freedom, you know, when I was starting the MFA, like thinking like, oh, wow, I don't have to do these paintings. It doesn't have to be a final result. I can just keep drawing and drawing and drawing. And that being the actual work, the process of drawing. And that's where I still am, you know, just the process of drawing constantly is my work. And when I do exhibitions, I bring a lot of them and then I make installations. I hang them up and they have like a visual con conversation on the wall. It's the same with ideas. If I get a great idea, it's usually really bad. You know, it's like when I get the feeling like, wow, I have this idea. I want to do this idea. And then, you know, the result is always like a disaster. So it's also, it is a statement. It is a concept not to have an idea. But I think that makes the process more interesting, working for the process, not for the outcome. Well, and that's the old standing debate of process versus product kind of thing. Totally, yeah. Yeah. Sadly, in America, they emphasize the product over the process. Okay. That's... That's unfortunate for a lot. I know. I, <laughs> I so wish I was born in Europe or at least maybe studied in Europe. Like you all have it so much better than really? we did. Okay. In many ways. In many ways, yes. Yeah. So you're talking about doing l lower quality materials, let's say, because it's cost effective, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. But like I found that as, as I get older and the more that I work, the more... Um, uh, snobbish I become about good materials yeah and like you know like I remember being a kid and I'd be like oh that's free I'll just make something with that mm -hmm. and people keep saying like oh well you're an artist why don't you just go make something and I'm like because I don't have my good materials that I use like I can't just make from any old piece of shit material I need my archival ph balanced whatever like you know stuff that I use that works <laughs> like yeah is that true with you as well? Did you sort of age uh -huh. into sort of oh, yeah. snobbery? Oh yeah, totally. But I think in the beginning, it's it's important to be able to get all this confidence. I can draw anything, any you know. I can just sit here and draw, and I'm not. But now, now of course, when I'm working, I I do use really good quality materials because I'm aging, and I find it more. <laughs> I I just find. The quality is, yeah, you know, it's. It has nothing to do with age. I don't want to imply anything like that, <laughs> but it, it has, it has to do with 
just sort of a, a maturity, a, a knowledge and experiences. Like you start mm -hmm. noticing like, you know, like you may, you did the example of newsprint. So like the difference of a newsprint versus a Reeves BFK, mm -hmm. that's a huge difference. Yeah. Like just the, the feel of it, the, the, the way it takes the inks and the paints, like, I mean, totally yeah. different reactions that these things have. Have you found a, a do you have a, a particular brand paper that you like these days? Yeah, I'm using watercolor paper because I use a lot of ink and watercolors and gouache and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm using heavy duty watercolor paper, which everybody knows it's quite expensive. But I think just to add to what I said, you know, with the cheap materials, once you're exploring, once you're doing an MFA or at school, it's so important to explore to create a lot. And once you figured out what it is that you're doing and you're more confident in it, that's when the snob kicks in. No, <laughs> that's when you start to need to <laughs> need better materials. But yeah, my favorite paper right now is like cotton watercolor paper. Particular brand, Fabriano, Reeves. What do you all get there? Like, what, Do you all have big art supply stores there? No. Okay, so you do like internet ordering and you have to pay tons in shipping for all this stuff. We have two good ones. They're they're not big, but they order good stuff. And I've also been able to order through them. And then I often, when I travel, I bring back with me a lot of supplies. Yeah, I've used all these, kind of, all these different kinds of paper that you're saying, you know, like, you know, I think now I'm using some Canson paper or mm -hmm. or the other one. What was the name? Fabriano Reeves. Yeah, I've used all of these, but yeah. Stonehenge. Yeah. I, I played, I did printmaking for a while. So like I, I am a little bit of a paper snob. I love a yeah. beautiful paper. Me too. It's It's really important, especially when, you know, working with things like ink and watercolors and it's really i used to work more with acrylics and when i was younger i just made everything on simple drawing paper and i think that can be really beautiful as well but then the materials have changed recently like only in the last year i've been using this watercolors and things that i haven't been really into which is interesting how a change of materials can be huge for an artist like the 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 hot pressed what, what cold pressed I don't remember what which is which the one with hot pre like, hot press is smooth cold yeah. press is textured smooth always smooth. hot press yeah you like hot press interesting I don't like the te texture <laughs> yeah I'm working on some works with uh six hundred GSM so like cardboard thickness wow like, okay yeah super expensive by by the sheet like holy crap so expensive yeah, i know <laughs> yeah. but luckily i didn't pay for it so that's fine <laughs> so l looking at your work you do a lot of work that is sort of what i would call sort of either permanent or sort of site specific kind of things mm -hmm. how do you pull that off like it's like I, I i've never done site specific work like that that basically you do it on a location and then basically when the exhibition's done it's gone yeah so like how how is that funded <laughs> like ah. how, how do you pay to pull i mean because when it's all done you can't sell it and so how does that work um i mean i guess i'm just used to not getting paid for my work i think <laughs> it's I, I i mean it's all for the you know i just it, if it's important for the exhibition I'm doing then you know if it's important for me I'll do it you know some places they pay you by you know like some museums they pay you by the hour when you're installing which is great but then you are doing something in a gallery or an artist run space of course you're not going to get paid but I think that's for me it's interesting to bring this up because uh the wall drawings are I feel a lot of the time that they're more a little bit like a performance, you know, it's something that's there for a certain amount of time. And to make it, I always enter the space with no sketches and no ideas really. And then I kind of like spend a lot of time in within the exhibition space and then I create something on the wall. And then after the exhibition, it gets painted over. 
So I just document it really well. And that's the work. And, and it's like, I get this question a lot of the time when you I've spent a lot made this detailed drawing on a wall, like, oh no, is it going to be painted over? But that's so important because that gives it less of a, you know, significance. If it's a permanent piece on a wall, it's really like, oh my God, I, this is going to be here forever. I have to make like this masterpiece. But then when it's like, oh, the exhibition runs for like, what, a month, six weeks? It's more playful, you know, it's really, and it can be really funny. Artist fees, you mentioned them in the museum, uh, yeah. that they pay an hourly rate. So the question would be just, uh, what do you know about them? And uh, because there's sort of a, uh, there's a movement to create these honorariums, yeah. stipends, artist fees for artists mm -hmm. to help pay for their installation times their travel their whatever kind of things like so like what do you know about that and do you support it yeah of course i think it's really important that the museums can pay their artists in iceland i only know mostly about what happens over here it's a fairly recent thing that we are getting paid there was a big movement about it pay visual artists so some museums now have extra funding to pay the artists and and also for the amount of installation time. Like last time I did a wall drawing in the Reykjavik Art Museum, I got paid by the hour. And that was like, oh my God, I'd never gotten anything like that before. Uh, you know, apart from Sweden, of course, where things seem to be like, yeah. <laughs> so, so you're telling us we should all go to Sweden to do I our art? You should, yeah, I think they have pretty fancy grants, but but at least the support system for the museums seem to get funded better. I mean, but this is a new thing, right, you know, over here. It sounds like I was not brought up in this luxury of getting paid by the hour. I've very often, like any every artist in Iceland, you know, like so many times I've done museum shows and the installation people are way better paid, of course, you know, and even, you know, the people that bring the work, you know, to the museum, the people that help you install it, everybody's getting paid, but not the artist. That's how it's normally was and sometimes still is. I, I guess in many countries it is, but fairly recently this has changed over here. So that I, I basically only know mostly about what happens here. And of course, having when I've done stuff in different countries, it varies so much between countries, what kind of support you get, if you get any support at all. Well, but it's a great question of like, why do preparators get paid their salaries to install your artwork in a museum but the artist whose work is being installed doesn't get paid for that time yeah isn't that's that very amazing? unfair isn't it amazing i mean i don't think any actor would be working on stage you know without being paid you know i i don't know why are we <laughs> why is it like that it's incredible well i mean it, it it goes back to the whole question of like why does the whole sort of starving artist thing even exist? Like, I hate that mm -hmm. term and I wish it never existed because yeah. it's made it so that like artists and creatives, you know, this is true, you know, writers, musicians, visual artists, all of us are kind of second class citizens. We're very looked down upon mm -hmm. versus people who have like, quote unquote, like normal jobs. Mm -hmm. Proper jobs. Why? <laughs> oh, you call it proper jobs? Okay, we'll go oh, with proper jobs. No, I'm jobs. joking. So... so in in contrast to the proper jobs yeah the, why are we looked down on because all those people that have those proper jobs they all go to concerts they all well and maybe not all but the, many of them go to museums they all have homes that they decorate with art so like we are an integral part of their lives whether it's like decorative works let's say on their walls or whether mm -hmm. it's the designers who do the ceramic work stuff that they use for their dishware or whatever. So like designers, creative people, artists, we are integral to their lives, but yet we are treated like second class citizens in comparison to them. Yeah. Do you want me to answer that question? <laughs> you can well, give it a whirl. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, 
Of course, some people just buy their artwork from IKEA. They just put up whatever was in inside that crappy frame they bought. Nope, but some artists <laughs> designed that. Oh, that that's a point. Yeah, but I I don't know. I'm I, I'm not sure. I think it's a lot of people they have proper jobs appreciate art work and artists and they buy work and they go to concerts and all this kind of thing so it's it's not like everybody you know a lot of people appreciate this and but i'm not sure i think every year in iceland there's a conversation like a conversation there's like a big fight on the internet when the artist grants you know the artist salaries are handed out and everybody goes crazy like not just artists that didn't get it uh most of them are like okay it's going to be a bad year but let's try again but there's always this huge argument online about you know this you know and it's like a hatred towards artists and we're taking money from you know the hospitals and they go all the way into like how that it's like this great hobby we have that they are paying their taxes to fund and blah 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 but anyway i i try not to read these things i think it's just a lot of the time it's a small group of people isn't it it's everywhere though yeah we get, we get the same thing in the united states we have the npr radio we have the national endowment for the arts and they are constantly being threatened with their budgets being cut and things like this yeah. so like it's a very normal thing in most countries to mm -hmm. underfund and underappreciate the arts and the irony is like this is the irony. i grew up in washington dc so politics and that kind of crap i actually know a decent amount the problem that i have with it is okay so like there are these senators and congress people so you know parliamentary people sitting there saying oh no we shouldn't fund the arts and then on weekends they go to the opera or to the theater or to art events and, and so they participate they 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 fund it by buying tickets and all that but they won't fund the the creation of it in the first place so like they cut the money on the one hand and then on the other hand they go out and participate in it so i'm like be consistent, just make a choice. Like I really, like I thoroughly admire the way Europe and even the Scandinavian regions uh, sort of put their, sort of put their money where their mouth is. They say like, we support the arts and here's our money. We really do support you. Now, don't get me wrong. They can always support more, mm -hmm. but at least they, they're doing substantially more than a lot of the world. You know, you go to Asia or South America, there's substantially less, you know, Africa, almost, mm -hmm. you know, very little arts funding per mm -hmm. se. I'm so sorry if I get that wrong. And hopefully some guests will correct me in the future if I got that wrong. But it seems like Europe and the Scandinavian regions, and I, and I separate them because they're not part of the EU, mm -hmm. but the, they, they seem to so do much. something well, like they do, they do it right, in my opinion, because at least they're trying to fund you all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I guess, compared to a lot of places, it's considered, you know, luxury. But no, I think, you know, everybody's very thankful when something like this happens, like during the pandemic, not that I was going to mention that, you know, like last year, there was obviously a lot of artists having a difficult time, especially performative arts and music and, you know, and also exhibitions getting canceled, you know, all that. Then we got some extra, we could apply for some extra funding there. So at least it was a part of the country's emergency plan to fund artists. It wasn't anything to change the world, you know, to change our lives, but it was still like, at least I felt like they were trying <laughs> so I felt really thankful about that. When I was a kid, I, I traveled to Belize and I, I was down there for like a month. And I I remember, so I was probably 18, 19 years old. And I remember the money, the currency in Belize had artwork by their national artist on their currency. Ooh. And when I saw that, I was like, holy shit, this country appreciates their artists to the extent that they're going to put the artwork by their national artists. A, they even have a national artist. That's a whole huge thing. But B, that they then put it on the currency. 
That's how important yeah. they saw art. Yeah. That just inspired me greatly that like there are places in the world where art and artists and creativity are admired and respected. Yeah, that has happened to you even. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Let's sort of wrap this up. I've got two little final questions that I always ask. So first question, could you name me three contemporary artists that you admire, respect, or are sort of looking at yourself? I've been a, like a David Lynch fan since, you know, I don't know when. I think that was a, a one of like a huge influence for me. Kate Bush. She's great. <laughs> like this amazing woman. You mean Kate Bush, the musician, right? The musician. Okay. I mean, there's so many filmmakers I could I could talk about, but it would be so hard to... I mean, I, I used to look at so many fil like I'm really interested in, you know, film and, you know, I used to look a lot at David Lynch and Ray Harryhausen and all these kind of more non-traditional, non-traditional, not non-Hollywood. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like, you know, I used to be inspired by Jan Swankmeyer's movies and, and all all. I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know where to start and where to end with people that have created something. And, and I would be sure to mention something that I would, if I mentioned someone, I would definitely have forgotten somebody else that was more important. Uh, last question is uh, some advice to the next generation. So next generation of artists, from your experiences, both positive and negative so like maybe some things that you did wrong in your career that you would say hey stay away from doing this kind of thing something helpful to them i don't know i think it's just really important not to you know think that there's a a certain calculated way to be you know it's just like totally the only thing you can do is to be yourself and make the work you know without it's 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 that simple. In my case, I didn't you know I didn't put my head into all these art magazines and and blah blah and try to like follow up what's going on. Or I think it's more like a conversation with yourself, you know. And if you want to get somewhere in your work, you just have to make the work, make a lot, and make mistakes, and make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> Well, but don't continue to make the mistakes. So you no, make until, mistakes, learn until from you, them and yeah. do better. Of course. But no, I, I love mistakes. I think they can be hilarious. You know, they can bring something. What you think is a mistake can actually be a beginning of something completely new. So I think to trust the process is the most important thing, to trust the process and not to like try to never to be desperate about the whole other, the art world thing. But it's really easy to be desperate in the whole art world thing because it's <laughs> it's it's a huge thing and yeah. there's lots of press and there's lots of social media and there's all kinds yeah. of stuff about it that make you they almost give you like uh like uh, uh imposter syndrome because like all these other people seem to be doing super well and getting press lots of social I media know, followers i know it's an exercise to try not to get desperate because it's it's a terrifying process but i think also bitterness is the pure evil that's the end of an artist basically so trying to stay away from that is super important oh yeah a lot of artists as they get older i hear more and more oh so and so took this opportunity from me or i lost yeah. this thing because of that person and and there's this it's very interesting like as artists get older the ones who aren't quote unquote like successful in whatever way end up having this sort of bitter attitude of like i could have been blah 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 but so and so didn't fund me or so and so wouldn't exhibit me and it's a very common thing that like older artists become more embittered you know, from a lack of gaining whatever sort of notoriety or success they desired or hoped for in their career mm -hmm. yeah it's true it's it's very natural to become bitter i guess <laughs> but it's like you know i think i'm gonna try every different way to stay away from that because it just seems to be the death of an artist to become bitter and that's when it all must 
be going downhill because it's it's all about you know not to dwell on all these things that you have to go through on the way to getting somewhere and and I think it never stops I think people even successful people can become bitter I mean it's it's never maybe I, this is my advice to myself you know trying it's what I'm going to try not to do I also get used to the word no you know like to get used to like oh I got to no and okay then I'll try again you know <laughs> cuz it's like a million no's to to get this yes and and it's going to happen that you know if you keep trying but if you dwell on the no then it's going to be no again I know I I spoke to a person who was applying for a residency somewhere and they happened to know somebody who worked there and the person who worked there they, they were friends and so the person said they they got rejected the first year and the person that the work there said oh well just be sure to apply again because we until you've applied three times we don't actually read your application <laughs> so <laughs> oh, so no. like they she had to end up applying i think like seven times in total before she actually got accepted but oh, like th that tenacity of continually repeatedly applying for things over and over is seems to be like a part of the art world that is a, such a sad state of affairs <laughs> well i think it's also important to try and find the comedy you know find look at the comedy side of it you know it is it is bizarre it's hilarious we are all applying for the same funds and blah blah we keep getting lots of no letters and we we don't get paid normally we don't get paid for our jobs we're really happy when we do you know it it's crazy so it's important to see the comedy side of it you know it's everything is possibly funny otherwise you know it's too depressing and and then we become bitter and then it's over <laughs> and on that note we'll wrap up this <laughs> podcast it's lovely amen <laughs> thank you very much for your time thank you very much for your time I hope you are enjoying and learning from these conversations as much as I am. If you like the podcast, we would appreciate a five-star rating and a nice comment would be greatly appreciated. Also, please tell your friends to listen and subscribe too. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014. I am your host, Matthew Doles. For more information about the podcast and our guests, please visit our website, wisefoolpod.com. The Wise Fool is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene i Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes or on our website, wisefoolpod.com. <laughs>